מתי אנחנו רואים? מי מלאך אותה? המזיין תראו כי נטיוש בהכילה חסף הכי לי ווקם מקווקם What I said to you in my language roughly translated into English is hello my relatives I'm an ally and I come from Yellow Thunder Village in our very sacred holy land the Black Hills In my culture when you speak before people that you haven't got to know we talk about ourselves first the anthropologists have labeled us therefore boastful people primitively boastful people but for you to uh, know that my words come from my heart you have to get know me a little bit you know there are other peoples in the world indigenous peoples around the world that have that share the same view including most of the Asians they believe that before you do business you should know one another at any rate I was born on the Pine Ridge Sioux Indian Reservation in what is now called the state of South Dakota. <coughs> and that was 65 winters ago. I was born before World War II, right? And I can remember World War II because I have uncles and aunties who served in that war. I also want to tell you I come from a matriarchal society. That's weird in a matriarchal society. And all my marriages have been matriarchal. I've raised my children matriarchal. But I have also was raised in a housing project, a multiracial housing project in Vallejo, California, after my folks during World War II, left the reservation to find work. And we ended up in Vallejo, California. My father went, went to work for the U.S. government, the United States Navy. And I grew up in the black neighborhood of public housing. Because at that time, they didn't know where to put us Indians. So they couldn't put us in with the whites, so they put us in with the blacks. And the public housing project. But there were a lot of Filipinos there. There were poor whites. There were a lot of Mexicans. And me and my brother. It was also during the time of the John Wayne, John Ford movies. So I grew up fighting every ethnic race in the housing project. And because I was an Indian. And John Wayne was supposed to have killed us all off. When my brother and I went to the movie theater on Saturday, we knew a fight was coming if it was a Western. Because after the movie, we'd come out of the movie and someone would invariably say, there's those Indians. And we'd have to fight our way to the sidewalk so we could run. That was, uh, that was an experience. <coughs> fighting during recess, fighting at before school, fighting after school, fighting on the way to school, fighting going home from school. I grew up fighting. So I, decided to be a boxer. They didn't have uh, Taekwondo for poor people in those days or any of that other fancy stuff. Violence was a very, part, a very big part of my life, still is. I know violence. Uh, after I joined the American Indian Movement in the 1970s, I suffered through five assassination attempts by the United States government. 
plus one year, three days, and 22 and a half hours in prison. In fact, uh, they tried to off me in prison. And a white man from the Aryan Brotherhood <coughs> stuck a knife in my heart. And, uh, but I lived. So he wasn't, he wasn't released from prison. He was sentenced down to a medium security prison as his reward for just wounding me. I imagine he would have made parole had he killed me. He had stabbed some Mexicans in Lompoc and blacks in Florida federal joint. He was at the Aryan Brotherhood, and he was on a railroad for the uh, federal, federal government to uh, kill political prisoners in the prisons. How he ended up in a maximum security state joint, which I was in, was obvious. A federal prisoner, never been in the state of South Dakota, ended up in a state maximum security prison. <coughs> at any rate. Yeah, I've been shot stabbed and beaten into a coma by the agents of COINTELPRO during the 1970s, been in prison. That's where I claim to my PhD in white studies. And I graduated from the South Dakota State Penitentiary. At any rate, I worked my way through college back in the 60s. It took me 10 years to work my way through four years of college. But in the American Indian Movement, I was a, one of the leaders. We were the only militant organization to survive the 1970s. All those militant organizations that the two different committees of Congress labeled as terrorists were, of course, the Black Panthers, the Young Lords of the Puerto Rican Liberation Movement, the Brown Berets of the Chicano Movement, the Weather Underground, and the American Indian Movement. Five. The five terrorist organizations of America back in the 70s. <coughs> before terrorism was such a loose term. At any rate, as I said, on January 1st, 1980, I walked into in the black community, I was going to stay at this brother's house in Washington, D.C. Kwame Ture was there when I walked in. Kwame Ture was about 6'6", six, six, had arms the width of this room, it seemed like. He saw me walk through the door and he says, Russell. And I came hugging and he says, we made it. We made it through the 70s. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Best, I, best New Year's gift I ever had, man. Call me Toure. I used to do joint, uh, joint college lectures with Kwame, different parts of the country, back in the 80s. And uh, with Kwame, he had a favorite answer to questions from the audience after we spoke. And he would tell whomever asked the question, he would say, organize, organize, organize. So I salute you, all of you who are organized. It's easy to mobilize. Anyone can mobilize. Like at Seattle. It's easy to mobilize. But it's very, very difficult to organize. <coughs> and if you don't believe it, all you have to do is look at the what's left of the labor movement in this country. Or look what happened to the civil rights movement. Or look what happened to the feminist movement. 